Dear colleagues, dear friends, first of all, I would like to thank you very much for inviting me and for making me a part of the 48 hours of otolaryngology meeting. Today, I'll be talking about unilateral vocal fault paralysis, and I am Dr. Haldun Oğuz from Ankara, Turkey. I have no conflict of interest to declare, and I would like to invite you all to the 30th Congress of the Union of European Phoniatricians that will be held at the end of April in Antalya, Turkey. Uh, our first, uh, my first words will be about the functions of glottis. As we all know, there are four main functions of glottis and largely of larynx. These are phonation, protection, breathing, and coughing. If somehow the vocal folds cannot open or close properly, one of those functions cannot be maintained. The symptoms with glottic insufficiency are usually related with dysphonia, as you see here. And sometimes there is a compensatory falsetto, there may be a vocal fatigue, uh, problems about aspiration and dysphagia as well. Vocal fault paralysis is the most common reason of it, but other uh, problems like vocal fault paralysis, traumatic tissue losses, is the one which is at the right side, which is a cortectomy type treatment for a learning cancer, uh, which is an iatrogenic uh, cause of glottic insufficiency. Uh, we know that presby larynx, uh, like 20% of the larynx of uh, the elderly have atrophy, so we may have dysphonia. The reason may be neurogenic, uh, maybe secondary to uh, radiation damage or sulci deficiency. Uh, and we want to, uh, and when we look at the nomenclature, uh, the the definitions of vocal fold paralysis. When we talk about paralysis or paralysis, the origin is usually neurogenic. For other problems that leads to motion problems at the vocal folds, like joint problems or tumoral problems, we prefer to use the words immobility or hypomobility. The etiology of vocal fold paralysis, unilateral vocal fold paralysis, uh, has numerous reasons, but most of them, like at least 90% of them in my practice are iatrogenic. These are usually due to secondary to uh, the head and neck carcinomas, head and neck surgeries, or big cardiovascular surgeries. The most common causes are thyroid surgeries and cervical spinal injuries in my practice. And as we all know that those patients with unilateral vocal fold paralysis have impaired voice results, both uh, their jitters and shimmers are increased and the noise to harmonics ratio is increased in those patients. When we have a glottic insufficiency, the treatment modalities for glottic insufficiency um, that originate from different reasons um, are usually similar. But of course, the main group is the unilateral vocal fold paralysis. We try to fill the existing space, and if needed, we, we try to regain the viscoelastic properties of the vocal fold. Uh, at the end, of course, our main, uh, uh, our main aim is to increase the quality of voice. There are two main options if we just ignore some of the options that are not much used in the clinic, uh, at least nowadays we are working on them, but we have two main options. The first one is the injection laryngoplasty or vocal fold augmentation, and the second one is the laryngeal framework surgery. About injection laryngoplasty, injection laryngoplasty provides minimal invasive medialization. It doesn't require any external incisions. It's easy to apply. It may even be performed in the office and easily tolerated by the patients usually, and there is a result uh, that are obtained in short term, actually, at the same time after just injection. If we would have an ideal injection material that is already readily available, which is cheap, and which may be taken easily if a revision is needed, which is biocompatible and biomechanical matching to the tissue that we are putting it in, uh, and which is resistant to resorption would be great, but we don't have that perfect material right, uh, yet. What do we have is for short term, um, on the market, there is carboxymethyl cellulose, but it's not uh, distributed to United States, uh, uh, outside United States. I mean, we don't have it in Europe or we don't have it in Turkey yet. What we usually use nowadays is uh, hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid is the most appropriate material for vocal fold viscoelasticity. It's a linear polysaccharide, uh, which means that it doesn't contain uh, proteins, so it's usually non-toxic, not antigenic, so it does not cause uh, much inflammation. It binds more water, so uh, it does lose less volume by time, and it's been used in dermatological cases for more than 20 years now. 
Uh, how long does it last in the tissue? Our own studies show that it doesn't last uh, for one year. Most uh, of the patients we see uh, result in like three to nine months. Uh, four to six months is actually a, a realistic approach about the stay of the hyaluronic acid at the tissue. For longer term materials, uh, there are different options again. Uh, the most commonly used one uh, in the previous days, in elder days, was uh, uh, Teflon, which we nearly never use uh, nowadays because it leads to chromatic chromatose reactions. So it's, uh, it's not used anymore. The most common used and still being used one is autologous fat, which is advantageous because it's easy to obtain, it's biocompatible, it leads to minimal inflammation, and its viscoelastic properties are similar to laminopropia. But it's this disadvantage is that you need to harvest it. I mean, you need to have a donor site, so you need to use liposuction or open incision to obtain that fat from the patient. And the problematic part is that duration of survival is highly variable among patients and also among the tissue that you obtain that fat. And, and there is always a need for overinjection while performing fat injection. So this may also lead uh, a dysphonia, I mean, uh, worse, ver worse voice results at the very first days. And also uh, sometimes, uh, although very minor, it may lead to airway problems as well. Uh, my colleagues from uh, uh, Scandinavia, especially from Finland, Temu, Kinnari, and Ahmed Genet are using this uh, approach. Uh, they are using autologous fascia uh, to obtain uh, material from the patient, and they inject it to the vocal folds. So this is another option for our patients. Temporal, uh, temporal muscle fascia is also another option uh, when we try to use autologous fascia for our patients. The most commonly used long-term material is calcium hydroxypatite. It's FDA approved beginning from 2002. There are two main brands in the market. Uh, it contains calcium hydroxypatite, which is already uh, present in the bones and teeth. So uh, it's, it's a safe material. And studies, radiological studies show that it lasts more than uh, 12 months, more than one year in most of the patients. Uh, a game changer about injection laryngoplasty may be silk hyaluronic acid. This is a very new substance, and, and you see a reference at the end of the uh, slide here, which is just the first preliminary results about this uh, injectable material. It's porous silk. It has porous silk microparticle suspensions, which is cross, which is in cross-linked uh, hyaluronic acid. It has its own catheter, as you see here above. Uh, it is used from the application channel of the flexible endoscope, high uh, chip on tip, distal chip flexible endoscope. So, uh, and, and it, it doesn't need any uh, over injection, which means that airway problems and, and, the, 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 and the dysphonia that we face at the very first days are not much common in these patients. So it's, it's a promising new substance and I am expecting to use it uh, in the upcoming days. How do we inject? Actually, we try to inject and medialize the whole vocal fold together. So the most commonly injected sites are just at the lateral part of the vocal process of the aritonite. Here you see the needle. And when you see the cross there, uh, it's the second part, which is the mid-membranous portion. So making that injection deep into the muscle to those spots usually medializes the vocal fold very well to the medial side. And according to the substance that you will use, you need to sometimes, as we talked about fat, uh, you need to uh, over inject it. Uh, which route should we use for injection? Actually, we have different options. The most, uh, the, the safest and the one that we usually use is uh, using the OR, which is the uh, elder technique. Uh, it, it is safe because our patient is already in the position that are, we are that we are so accustomed to. Uh, we are using the microlaryngoscope and the suspension. You see, we have the uh, we have the flexion of the neck from the thorax and extension of the head from the neck, which is what we call the Jackson position. Uh, and we reach our patient's vocal folds uh, as we are making a microlaryngal surgery. You see, the injector is entering to the left vocal fold. This is one of my. Uh, very elder patients, which means that more than 10 years of video, this is, and, and at the left side, you see just before, uh, I mean, the, at the photos at the inferior part of the slide, you see that at the left side, just before injection, and the right one is just after injection of the hyaluronic acid. 
If you have rigid, uh, rigid angled telescopes with you, it's also easier to make it in the OR. Here you see two of my patients. The one above is a right uh, vocal fold paralysis patient just before and after making the injection. And the left side and the inferior side, you see that uh, left vocal fold paralysis patient just before injection and just after injection. Of course, we can use the peroral road in the office as well. Uh, the advantage for making it in the office is, of course, having the patient's voice feedback. I mean, you can hear the voice of the patient. So after you just injected, the, both uh, the clinician and the patient can hear the voice. And it's also done by endoscopic guidance from the flexible endoscope from the nose. And by pulling the tongue out, the injection is made from the oral cavity. For that reason, uh, you can just use the needles that come uh, by calcium hydroxide uh, hepatitis itself, or you can use an uh, orotracheal injector. Uh, another route is the transnasal route. It's ex actually, this was the least uh, referred route uh, until now, but I think after that uh, silk hyaluronic acid, which comes with its own flexible uh, catheter, which is used from the application channel of the flexible endoscope, we will be talking about transnasal approach more and more. The third route is percutaneous route, and this route has three options. First one is the transthyroid, I mean, going through the thyroid cartilage, this is cartilage which, which is the least used one because you need to pass through the bone for elder patients. So uh, it's, it's difficult to make it uh, clinically. The second route is using the cricothyroid space, which is actually the... Uh, the easiest because you have least amount of injectable loss there. Uh, you can reach the points that you want to reach uh, easier. And the third route uh, going through transcutaneous is the thyroid from using thyroid membrane with an angle from above to below to reach the vocal folds. So injection laryngoplasty has limitations if the patient has a wide glottal gap. And if there is a symptomatic posterior glottic gap, we know that uh, it is resorbed by time. So there is a need for reinjections. And according to the material that you use or according to the carriers that you have, you always need an overinjection. And if you use an autologous tissue, of course, there is additional morbidity for the donor side. But it may be a choice in situations if there is a temporary vocal fold paralysis, if the glottic gap is too narrow, if there are any kind of contraindications to open surgery, like radiation or extensive fibrosis of neck, and if there is a, a, a need for paraglottic space extension before medialization, or if there is a need for makeup after medialization, of course, it's the procedure of choice. When we have an iatrogenic vocal fold paralysis or an idiopathic vocal fold paralysis, uh, when should we aim it? Actually, we have a very rapid response for this, which is as early as possible, because there are numerous references that are coming, uh, some of them you see here, uh, that are being published every day, which shows that uh, injection, uh, early injection decreases aspiration and increases cuff ability for sure. So there are less pulmonary infections. There is a shorter uh, duration of hospital stay for large cardiovascular surgeries if patients are injected early. Of course, the uh, acoustic and aerodynamic voice outcomes are better. And if the patients are injected early, there is at least four times decreased need for long-term type 1 thyroplasty surgeries. And that more favorable medial vocal fold position during the time window of uh, synkinetic regeneration and increased vibrotactile sensory feedback from the healthy vocal fold promotes local nerve regeneration. And in a new study, actually this figure is from that study, it shows that restoration of the proprioceptive feedback enhances also the central neural recovery process. Uh, is there any space for using early electrical surface stimulation? Some studies say yes. Uh, and they say that this, this increases the preferential nurse, nurse protein and improves the functional outcomes. Is there any space for using medications uh, for this purpose? And some studies say, again, yes. Uh, using nimodipine, which is a calcium channel broker, actually increases the uh, axonal growth by affecting growth cones at the nodes, which leads to 14 times higher uh, vocal fold motion recovery uh, when it's compared at three or six months after vocal fold uh, dysfunction. The second part of this lecture will be about the laryngeal framework surgery. It will be a shorter part. 
Mediation laryngoplasty mainly uh, is done under local anesthesia with flexible endoscopic guidance. We reach the thyroid cartilage, we open a space on thyroid cartilage, and then at this, at this space, we use some implants to medialize the paraglottic space muscles and, of course, the vocal fold to the medial part. For this purpose, most commonly used one are uh, cytostatic blocks, which are shaped during surgery by the surgeons. And the one that I usually use is Gore-Tex, which is a preformed uh, strip that you can use for cardiovascular surgeries and also for thyroplasty. You prefer uh, you you make some sheets or strips about uh, from them, and then you can just uh, put uh, into the cartilage as much as you need with flexible guidance. Here you see one of my patients with Gore-Tex on the thyroid window. Uh, there are preformed implants like Montgomery, which is very common. A uh, common it comes in different sizes. Or there are newer, newer ones like Matsushima, uh, the, the one that you shape before making the surgery, but during surgery. And sometimes mediation laryngoplasty is not enough. There are a need for a, additional aritonate procedures or glucothyroid procedures. And for this purpose, there are two different aritonate procedures. First one is the aritonate adduction. For this, uh, a posterior fenestra, posterior window is opened uh, at the thyroid cartilage. And the muscle process of the arytenoid is uh, diagnosed, and then and then you make a suture there, and you bind the suture to the anterior part of the larynx, and to be able to reposition the arytenoid. The second surgery is uh, defined by Steven Zaitas, and it's usually combined by cricothyroid subluxation, which is called adduction arytenoidopexy. At that surgery, arytenoid is repositioned and stabilized on crico cricoid uh, cartilage. And then the suture passed, and then another, uh, uh, after dislocating the inferior horn of the thyroid cartilage, uh, it, is, uh, it is united with the anterior part of the uh, chyroid, uh, cricoid, cricoid cartilage, so it simulates the uh, action of cricothyroid muscle. Different surveys, different enquetes show that, uh, among the laryngologists, of course, uh, although like one third of mediasis and laryngoplasty uh, patients have large posterior glottic gaps. Only 8% have uh, at the surgery an arytenoid procedure. So one of my colleagues from Ankara, Turkey, uh, performed a study, a uh, actually a prospective study, with patients that have posterior glottic gaps, and they divided those patients to five groups. All of them had their mediasis and laryngoplasties. First group had adduction arytenoid uh, uh, adduction. Second group had arytenoid uh, plus cricothyroid sub subluxation. Third group had the routine silicone processes. Fourth group had the Montgomery, and the fifth group had the silicone processes with a long posterior tail. And they have shown that the patients with arytenoid procedures uh, were much better statistically uh, about their voice and swallowing outcomes uh, according to, uh, I mean, when they are compared to the other non arytenoid procedured patients. However, in the literature, there are very interesting um, there are very interesting reports as well. For example, this report uh, from Journal of Voice is from South Korea. They 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 mentioned that they don't have any commercial implants that are uh, validated in their country uh, that are sold in their country. So they are not making any kind of uh, mediation laryngoplasties and they totally replace it with injection laryngoplasty and they get similar results with injection laryngoplasty with medialization thyroplasty. But they are still making arytenoid procedures to their patients and, and they define that making those procedures one by one, I mean, all the, the patient may have the arytenoid procedure first or the injection first, adding the second one to the first one increases the outcomes, increases the life quality of uh, their patients. And some uh, interesting uh, reports, uh, a few more interesting reports, that show that making injection to the lateral and anterior part of uh, arytenoid cartilage, as if be, uh, making an arytenoid surgery by injecting fat, uh, may give similar results. They are injecting the fat to the vocal fold, as you see at this C uh, figure. Uh, they are injecting to the vocal fold, and also they are injecting to the anterior and lateral part of the arytenoid cartilage. They have a nice uh, 3D graph uh, at the right side of the slide, 
uh, it shows that the arytenoid is being rotated as if being uh, reoperated uh, with arytenoid, uh, arytenoid apexy or arytenoid adduction. A similar, uh, a similar interesting article is from, uh, I think this one is from Japan. They are using a material, actually a powder that is that's prepared during surgery in the OR, uh, which is similar to calcium hydroxypatite, but it's called the calcium phosphate cement. And they injected from the medial uh, surface of the piriform sinus lateral to the arytenate, and they fix it there for like minutes. They are waiting there, and then they reposition the arytenate. And they also make they are also using the same paste, the calcium phosphate paste in the vocal fold as well. And they say that they are providing medialization plus arytenate repositioning with this technique. Uh, as I said in silk hyaluronic acid, there may be a game changer about the framework surgeries, which is called the voice implant. Uh, I didn't have the chance to use it yet, but it's uh, it's again a pre-manufactured implant like Montgomery. But uh, when you put it uh, inside the inside the thyroid cartilage and when you medialize the vocal folds, you can inject it. It is a balloon that can be injected, so you can reposition during surgery. And even after surgery, uh, if the edemocase is, for example, after the surgery and you need to overfill, you need to uh, fill it again, uh, you can use it. I think this will be, again, a game changer for uh, treating our unilateral vocal fold paralysis patients. I just tried to summarize what do we have uh, in our hands to be able to help to be able to treat our unilateral vocal fold paralysis patients. Uh, I, uh, again, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, and I thank you for your patience, and we are expecting to see you all uh, in the 30th Congress of the Union of European Phoniatricians at the end of April. Uh, we are waiting to you, we are waiting you to Antalya, Turkey. Thank you very much.